Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Turn with me to Psalm 34.3, Psalm 34.3, and we're all going to read this together. Psalm 34.3, Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. And I'm asking you this morning to magnify the Lord with me. I'm going to magnify him today. And I want you to magnify him with me. We're going to do it together. There, there's something about magnifying the Lord with somebody who wants to magnify the Lord. Now, sometimes you want to magnify the Lord, and you go to your friend, and they go, well, you just, I, I understand that, but you just don't know how bad things really are. And then they say things like, I know you say we just got to have faith, but I just like to call things the way they are. According to the Word of God, and you know this, if you keep calling them the way they are, because Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty three that you get what you say, things are going to continue to be the way they are. Now, I don't know about you, but even though things are good, I don't want them to stay the way they are. I want them, in the words that all the hillbillies and the Ozarks can understand, I want things to get gooder. And gooder and gooder and gooder. Because every day for a believer should be better than the day before. We used to sing that song in the Baptist church. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Kind of makes you want to go into the ballroom, doesn't it? No. <laughs> but uh, we should expect things to be better. Our best days are yet to come. And I know that there are people in this room, as I said a few moments ago before we started, we had two funerals, We a combined funeral in here. One, one lady in our church, precious lady. You know, in one month she became an orphan and a widow. Her, her dad and her husband passed in the same month. And we had a going home celebration for them yesterday. It was, I mean, it was powerful. It was powerful. But we need to understand that our best days are yet to come, and it doesn't matter what's happened. You, you cannot allow yourself to have any more sad days. Now, I'm going to do something I normally don't do, but let's just say within the last short period of time, you've had somebody that you know that's passed and gone over into glory. Stand up right now. If you know somebody that's passed and gone over into glory in the last short period of time, praise God, your husband's funeral was just this last week. Praise the Lord. And I understand, sir, uh, our visitor from Kansas, uh, your wife just passed. Is that correct? So, and your son. We were, oh, and we could go around the room. Your, oh, praise God. You may be seated. Well, let me tell you something. For all of those who have stood, and myself, my sister passed this year. There should not be sadness in our life. Now, we can miss them. It's okay to miss them. It's okay to reminisce and miss somebody. But not at the point of having pain and not at the point of having sorrow so deep that you can't get up in the morning or so bad that you can't control yourself. Now, granted, there, there is a type of sadness. There is a type, a type of sorrow. And the Bible even implies that there's a type of sorrow that Christians have. But here's the key. It says we don't sorrow the way they sorrow because they have no hope. They have no hope, but we have hope. I was thumbing through my pictures on my iPhone 10 thing, and I'm just clicking through the pictures, and all of a sudden, you know, sometimes even though some of us are older, and I know many of you can't relate with this, but some of us were born before the internet. And, uh, well, Al Gore hadn't been born yet, so it hadn't been invented. So, you know, we, did, we weren't raised with phones. I remember watching the first person that I had ever seen take pictures with a digital camera, and they were going click, 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 and I thought, man, they're wasting a lot of film. 
you know, film doesn't exist anymore. Huh. But I was thumbing through my pictures, and I, I came across a picture, and it was a picture of my hand and my sister's hand together. And I had just clicked that at my sister's house on the day she passed. I'm holding my sister's hand, talking to my sister, just before she went to glory. Now, did it affect me? Yeah, it affected me. Kind of choked me up. But it didn't destroy me. And the reason it didn't destroy me is because I know where she is. And I know where she is because of what Jesus did. And because of what Jesus did, I can have joy. And I can praise him. You know, King David, he's a pretty cool guy, you know freckle-faced little kid, but he was, a, he was a good guy. Had a slingshot, by the way. And uh, he had some soldiers with him, and he had a kind of escaped from a bad situation. Um, how bad was the situation? Well, the enemy came in, stole his wives, plural, stole his kids, burned down his houses, killed his servants, and he's hiding in a cave with his mighty warriors. And his mighty warriors are getting together over on the other side of the cave and they're saying, you know, it's his fault. Why don't we just kill him? Now, let's put it this way. David was having a bad day. Things, <laughs> things weren't just going the way he had planned when he got up that day. But the Bible says he encouraged himself in the Lord. He encouraged himself in the Lord. How do you do that? How do you encourage yourself when nobody else is around? So often we need somebody else to encourage us. Would you just say something that would make me feel better? Would you help me out here? Can I put my head on your shoulder? Can, can, can we just, I need somebody to cling to. No, 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 no. How can you encourage yourself in the Lord? How did David do it? Did he go over in the corner of the cave while they're all over there figuring out where to go get the rocks to stone him? Did he go over into a corner of the cave and go, oh, it's bad. Oh, God, it's bad. I don't know if you can see what's going on here, God, but it's bad. It's bad. And then you start, you know, spiraling down because it's bad. No, he didn't do that. What did he do? Holy, 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 holy. And he started encouraging himself by praising God. And see, that's, that's, how, you, that's how you get yourself out of the funk that you, you get yourself into. Let's take a look at another scripture. Psalm 69, 30. Psalm 69, 30. I will praise the name of God with a song, and I will magnify him with thanksgiving. Okay, now look, so what does it take? It takes singing and being thankful. Well, how could, how could David be thankful in the situation that he's in? See, look, you don't thank God for what's happening, but you thank him in what's happening. Things may be a mess all around you. You don't thank him, say, God, thank you for, you know, having my house burnt down today and my wife's all stolen. and That could have been a blessing. I don't know. But he said, he said you know, he, he didn't say thank you for all of that. Not in my case it wouldn't have been. It, I was talking about King David there. Okay. Let's take a look at another scripture. Ezekiel 38, 23. Time to change the subject here. No, what, 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 did, what did David do? Well, the way you magnify the Lord, according to Scripture, is with a song and thanksgiving. And he, he sang. Where do you think that he sang from? He sang from the Bible hymnal, the book of Psalms, the book of songs. I mean, a lot of these songs he wrote himself. Some were written by the patriarchs. There's one in here that they believe is, was even written by Adam. Look at this. 
Ezekiel 38, 23. Thus I will magnify myself. Hey, if you don't magnify God, he'll magnify himself. I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. L-O-R-D, yud Hey vav Hey. Lord God Almighty. Hmm. Well, how do you... Uh, How do you magnify God when things are bad? Well, I tell you one way you can say that God's good. Little kids. Hey, my dad's better than your dad. My dad can whoop your dad. My dad can whoop your dad with one hand tied behind his back, a blindfold and spin him in a circle, and tie one foot to a tree and he can beat your dad. I mean, that's... That's the way kids are. We need to be the same way with God. My God doesn't even have to think about it to beat your God. I mean, that's remember Elijah and the prophets of Baal? Remember that? They're out there cutting themselves, throwing themselves on the altar, trying to get their God to do something. And Elijah's over there. It's in the Bible. He says, where is your God? Why isn't he showing up? Did he go to the bathroom? Hello, my God's better than your God. Let me tell you something. The God of this world has nothing on me because my God's better than the God of this world. Are there other gods? Yes, there are other gods. How do we know that? Because the word tells us, put no other gods before me. He didn't say, don't, don't worry about it. There are no other gods. No, he said, put no other gods before me. Seek ye first, Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. What are some things that can be added? Well, we know that that scripture is talking about what you eat, what you wear, and where you live, but it's also talking about joy and peace. You read all of that Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus is talking about joy and peace. You want joy and peace? You want things to calm down in your life? You want things to settle? If I could just have a day where things were settled down. Well, how about this? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and it will be added to you. How do I seek him? With song and praise. Magnify the Lord. Exalt his name. Wow. Acts 10.45. Let me show you something here. New Testament. So Peter was out preaching, and he had some of his Jew friends with him. And they were preaching to the Gentiles. And right in the middle of Peter's sermon, and you know, you just don't want to mess up a preacher's sermon. That was kind of humor, but it's true. <laughs> right in the middle, right in the middle of Peter's sermon, these Gentiles believed God. And when they believed God, well, let's just read what they did. And those of the circumcision who believed, that's the Jews, were astonished. As many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles. Okay, now, you got these Gentiles, they're not saved, they don't believe in Jesus, and all of a sudden Peter's preaching, and while he's preaching, they believe, and the gift is poured out on them. What gift? How did, how did the Jews who were with Peter, know that the Gentiles had received this gift. How did they know? Verse 46, next verse. For, and those of you who know the Greek, that can also be translated because, because they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. So here's a couple of things that took place with the Gentiles, when they received the Holy Spirit, remember the joy you had when you received the Holy Spirit for the first time? Remember that joy? Well, you can receive that joy on a daily basis because the Bible talks about being filled with the Holy Spirit and then those who are being filled, you can skip a few chapters and you find they were filled with the Holy Spirit again and we need to be filled and filled and refilled with the Holy Spirit. And what happened? 
They spoke with tongues and magnified God. Now, they didn't just speak with tongues. They spoke with tongues and magnified God. Now, what's that word magnify there mean? That means exalt him. They praised him. And they said to the devil, my God's bigger than you. No weapon formed against me will prosper because greater is he who is in me who is in the world. And I can do all things through this Jesus Christ who strengthens me. I will not fail. I will prevail. I love Jesus. How did David encourage himself in that cave of Agilin? How did he, how did he encourage himself when everybody was trying to kill him? Have you ever been in a room? Pastors experience this from time to time. With three or four hundred people who look like they want to kill you? Now, <laughs> they're just waiting for an opportune time. <laughs> they're trying to figure out who's going to throw the first tomato. What did David do? He encouraged himself. That song we sang today, Praise Him, the Holy Cannoli song, that song. You say, well, I really don't know that song. Well, you, you know this much of it. Praise Him, praise Him and lift Him up. Praise him, praise him and lift him up. If you know no more than that, you know that. Praise him. And then put the words personal. Praise him, I will lift him up. Praise him. And then make it to him. Praise him, I will lift you up. Praise you, Father, I will lift you up. You start exalting the Lord. And then what else? You're filled with the Holy Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. You say, well, but the Bible says when I pray in the Spirit, I don't know what I'm saying. True, but the Bible goes on to say in Romans 8, 26 and 27, when you pray in the Spirit, you're praying the will of God. You may not know what you're saying. You know, it really bugs me when people talk about how tongues has passed away when it's all through the New Testament. Right here in this situation, Gentiles even. It wasn't just the Jews that followed Jesus. Here's a group of Gentiles. They get filled with the Holy Spirit. As, as my granddad used to say, they don't know diddly squat. They know nothing. And what happens? They get filled with the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden, they start speaking in tongues and magnifying God. That's the natural result of having the Spirit of God inside of you, and you just letting go. And that's what you need to do. You need to just let go. Sometimes you, we're holding on to something so tight and God's trying to give us something else, but we can't take it because our hands are grasped around something. He's saying, let go of that so I can give you something better. And we go, but, but what if I don't get something better? You're doubting God. When you're at that point, you're doubting God. See, we need to believe what God says. And he says we move from glory to glory to glory it gets gooder and gooder and gooder I need to remember sometimes we have people watching in other countries who really don't know what a hillbilly is so when we magnify God we're magnifying his good works we are magnifying him when we magnify his good works we need to thank him for what he has done, right? Well, what, what has he done? Hello, take a deep breath. You're here. He created you. He made you. And he made you in his image. And he loved you so much that while you were a mess, he looked down through the corridors of time and knew you would be in a mess and he sent his son Jesus to die so that you didn't have to. Why? Because he loves you. See, that's jumping and shouting words right there. Well, praise the Lord. See, in Old Testament times, they sacrificed in the temple. Remember the temple? Bring in the lamb. <laughs> Blood squirting all over the place. Yeah, kind of messy, wasn't it? They did their sacrifices in the temple. 
But the Bible tells us that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit now and that we are to offer up a sacrifice of praise. Look it up. It's what the Bible says. We are to offer up a sacrifice of praise. And what is it? It's the fruit of the lips. So how do we do what they did in the Old Testament, only we do it better? Is we sacrifice on a daily basis, but we sacrifice songs and words of praise. The sacrifice of praise. And where do we do it? We do it in the temple. Where's the temple? How do I get there? Hey, you're it. You are the temple. You know, the Bible tells us. Paul said, he, he wrote, and he, it's, you can almost hear him saying, don't you know, because he said it that way, don't you know, don't you know this? You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. God lives not in the Ark of the Covenant. He lives in you. So praise him in the temple. Wow, I like that. What will it do? Well, I'll tell you one thing it'll do. When you praise God, when you exalt him, when you pray in the Spirit, it confuses the enemy. Now, the enemy is a little confused anyway, or he wouldn't be the enemy. You know, as one, one of the kids came up to me at Children's Church a few years ago. I'll never forget this. I think Sarah, oh, everybody wave at Sarah. Sarah, hi, Sarah, hi. And uh, I think Sarah was there in the atrium when, uh, when this child came up to me. I said, well, how how'd you like Super Kid Academy today? I said, oh, I love Super Kid Academy, loved it. I said, well, what would you find out? He said, well, we studied all about how the devil's an enema. <laughs> they misunderstood. The devil's our enemy, you know. But, but sometimes, <laughs> you know, uh, the, enemy, the enema gets confused. Let's take a look at a story in the Bible. Second Chronicles. Chapter 20, you can turn over there if you'd like. That's where the pages are white. 2 Chronicles, chapter 20, verses 20 to 24. So they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness. Okay, you got it? So they rose early and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa, and as they went out, Jehoshaphat, once again, aren't you glad that your parents didn't give you that Bible name? You ever, ever think about if, he, if they had of what your nickname would have been? Fat. <laughs> your, his real name's Jehoshaphat. We just call him Fat for short. <laughs> oh. Okay. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. Next verse. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and were saying. Now, he sent the praise and worship team out in front of the soldiers. I heard a preacher say one time, well, that's because they were the most dispensable. Now, that's not true. They were the most indispensable because that's representative of what you do first. When you go into battle, you go out first with the praise and worship, all right? As they went out before the army and were saying, here's what they were saying, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Hallelujah. Kito. Ki le'alam hasdo. Ah, you're doing okay. That's what they were saying in Hebrew. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. His mercy endures forever. Wow. Well, what did that do for him? Verse 22. Now, when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes 
against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come out against Judah, and they were defeated. Wow. What happened? They praised. Their army went out, but before the army was the praise and worship team. And as they praised, they said, praise the Lord. His mercy endures forever. They were singing that, singing and praising. And what happened? While they were doing that, the Lord set up ambushes. And the Lord fought their battle for them. Does that ring a bell with anybody? About The Lord says, I'll fight your battles for you. See, sometimes our biggest problem is we're trying to do everything ourselves. We're trying to fight our own battles. We're trying to win our way. God is saying, hey, give me the ball. I'll run with it. Because who's going to tackle the Lord? Come on. So you praise and worship, it confuses the enemy. Hmm. Here's something else that happens. It empowers our faith when we praise and worship. Take a look at Romans 4, verse 20. Romans 4, verse 20. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Wow. He was strengthened in faith. Why? He gave glory to God. Go to the next verse, verse 21. And being fully convinced that what he had promised he was also able to perform. Here is the reality. You give glory to God, and it will strengthen your faith because when you give glory to God, he fights your battle for you. He wins. Your faith gets strengthened whether you see the victory or not. You, you, you have strength before the victory. David encouraged himself in the Lord in that cave. While he was encouraging himself in the Lord... Something was going on in the realm of the Spirit. But when he started encouraging himself, his family was still kidnapped, his house was still burned down, and the guys were still trying to kill him and figure out how they could do it when he started to praise. You don't wait to praise the Lord when things turn. When things start, you know, when things just get a little bit better, I'm going to start praising him. No, no. When you are at the deepest point of the pit is when you say, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Wow, God's good. You know, I'm going to read this to you in the Amplified, that scripture. It says, no belief or distrust made him waver or doubtingly question concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong and was empowered by faith as he gave praise to God and glory to God faithfully satisfied and assured that God was able and mighty to keep his word and to do what he has promised. We, we must take the promises of God to us, and we must believe them. That's what faith is. Somebody asked one time, why do you call it Walk on the Water Faith Church? Why don't you just call it Walk on the Water Church or Walk on the Water whatever? Because faith is the key. Uh, Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Well, what is pleasing God? What pleases him? What pleases him is when we believe him. God gets real happy when we believe what he says. And he gets real distressed, and take that word properly. He, he, he doesn't, let's put it this way, he doesn't like it when we don't believe him. Now, you're the same way. You tell somebody something, and you know it's true. You tell them something, and you know that you know that you know it's true. You know it's true because you were there, you witnessed it, you know it's true. This is not a rumor, this is not a hand-me-down. You know firsthand it's true. And you tell your friend, and your friend says, well, I don't know if I can believe that or not. But you know it's true. Now, it may be a, almost an unbelievable type story, but you want your friend to trust you enough that they will believe everything you tell them no matter how bizarre it is. Well, God has told us some pretty bizarre things when you really think about it. 
I will quicken your mortal body. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring that body out of the grave when I come back, and I'm going to give you a better body. Really? No, no, we need to believe that. We, we must believe truly that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. When you're out in the world and something comes against you, I know many of you in here own businesses, you're, you're doing business in the world, and Jesus said in John chapter 17, he said, Lord, don't take them out of the world. Leave them in the world. They're not of the world, but they're in it. That's, that's how we win people to Jesus is we are of God but we're in the world, and when we're in the world, we live in the kingdom of God, and we have the kingdom of God is within us, the Holy Spirit is within us, and we live by godly principles, and we're in the world, and the world sees it. But we've got to believe it. We must believe that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. We must believe that no weapon that's formed against me is going to prosper. We must believe that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us and believe it so much that there's no wavering. And if you can believe that, then what's going to happen is you're going to get all excited. You're going to get all excited just like I did with my baseball game. You've all heard my baseball game story, right? Yeah, praise the Lord. Well, we have one visitor that hasn't. I may tell it again later. We'll see. So, it empowers your faith. Hmm. You know, something else, that when you praise and worship, when things look bad all around you, and you praise and worship, you just decide you're, going, you're just going to get down with your bad self, your good self, and you're going to worship. It gives you the right entrance to God. God loves that. You, you can worship your way right into the throne. You know, there's been times when, when I've, I've worshiped, and I got so close. I was uh, driving home. We lived 30 minutes from where my office was at one time. And I was on my way home, and I was in a, in a pickup. And I was by myself, and I had left Gravoy Mills. And uh, I was singing, I love you, Lord. And just driving down the road, uh, the radio was off. And I'm driving down the road, didn't have both hands in the air, just kind of. But I'm just singing, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship thee. And I was just enjoying myself. And before I got to State Road P, now for those of you who know, who know the roads on the other side of the lake, that's probably around uh, two miles or something like that. Before I got to State Road P, just before I got to where Piker's Corner was, I heard a voice in the cab harmonizing with me. Now, don't get weird. It, it wasn't that I got over on the side of the road where the, the car goes, and, and, and I'm going, I think that's the key of C. And then I start singing. It wasn't anything like that. You know, it wasn't that the wipers were making noise. Nothing. I mean, someone was in that vehicle singing the words I was singing, and they were harmonizing with me on pitch. Well, I didn't turn and look. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, I kept singing. I sang all the way from State Road P, from before State Road P, all the way down to Laurie, all down past St. Patrick's Catholic Church, and I lived up off of Highway 135 at that time. And I had never looked over to the right. I mean, I knew no one was in the vehicle with me. I knew that. But when I went to turn onto Highway 135, I glanced to the right, saw the empty seat, and the singing stopped. Now, someone may ask, have you ever been institutionalized? Uh, <laughs> No, I did, I did work at a psychiatric ward once, but I was working there. I wasn't a patient. Um, I didn't hear that, but I assume it was pretty good. <laughs> I'll ask what it was later. Just dub in some music there. Uh, and <laughs> Do 
But I know this. There are angels. We are not angels. And everyone who stood up and you had someone pass from this realm to the next realm, they didn't become an angel. No, you're, you're mankind and you stay mankind. And angels are created angel kind and they stay angel kind. And they're created to minister to us. But that's just it. They're created to minister to us and for us. Actually, for us. That's what the scripture says. When, we, when our bodies quit working, angels escort us into the presence of God. That's scriptural. That's what the Bible says. But I believe I didn't see, but I heard. And I know, and I just know in my spirit, that there was an angel in the vehicle with me that day. We've had visitors here at this church. It's happened on two separate occasions in the last short time where they have, these visitors did not know each other. They were from different cities. And they saw an angel standing over here. And they both described the angel. And when they described the angel, two different people, they don't know each other. They're telling it separate from each other. They're not together. And they describe the angel the exact same way to the point that he was so tall that when the ceiling was up there, that he was like this. What, what, what are the odds? Two different visitors. Not just I saw it in the auditorium, in, in the same spot in the auditorium. That's where Steve plays. Steve. <laughs> it's sacred ground around the accordion. Oh, praise God. But uh, let's take a look at Psalm 100, Psalm 100, verse 4. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. I'm telling you, praise and worship will give you entrance to God. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name, verse 5. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Wow, isn't that good? You want to move into the presence of the Lord? I was talking with my son this morning, and he said, Dad, don't, you, you know that God inhabits the praises of his people. It's scriptural. God inhabits, he literally, somehow, in the dimension that he's in, he can move into, he can literally move into your praise. You say, well, how can that be? Well, see, we don't understand all the dimensions of God. I need to teach on that sometime. The Jews believe that there are 70 dimensions. The rabbis and sages believe that there's 70 dimensions to the Hebrew language. And, and we've shown that before here, where you can take the Hebrew language. Uh, we took the 23rd Psalm, and we have it on... I think we have it on video up in the bookstore. It's in that set called the Hebrew language on DVD. But uh, Uri Harrell, who was a professor of uh, Hebrew at Arizona State University, he's not a Christian, he was born in Israel. And uh, in fact, we were supposed to be in Israel when he passed. But I've personally never met him. But he had a project called uh, the Music from God Project. And at Arizona State University, he worked on this project. And what he believed is that there were 70 dimensions to the, every Hebrew letter. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet. He believed that every letter had a numerical value, and we know that that's true. Aleph is one, Bet is two, Gimel's two. Three dollars, four, and we know that the, and we know that every letter has a symbol. You know, every letter has a symbol, and they believe that there were seventy dimensions. He believed that every letter had a tone. Every letter had a tone, and that there were twenty-two strings on King David's harp. And that that was three octaves. And you say, well, there's eight notes in an octave. Three times eight is twenty-four. And if he had twenty-two strings, well, but. You know, when you get to do, re, mi, fa, so, when you get to a, a, c, d, e, you know, middle C is twice. It's in the previous octave plus the next octave. So you have 22 notes in three octaves. 
And so what he did, uh, see, he believed that when David went in and played his harp for King Saul, remember what the Bible says? David played his harp and the demons left. He believed that when David went in and played his harp, that the demons didn't leave just because they didn't like the song. You know, David didn't come in and go, I'm going to play a song. Dun, 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 And all of a sudden, you know, all of a sudden, the demons go, whoa, we don't like that song, and they're out of there. No, it wasn't that the demons didn't like the song. There had to be more. Well, if each tone is connected with a letter in the Hebrew alphabet, if each... If each tone is connected to a letter, then is it possible that David, when he played the harp, he actually played the Word of God? He was playing out words. So what Uri Harrell did is he took the 23rd Psalm in the Hebrew text. He took the 23rd Psalm in the Hebrew text, and he assigned each Hebrew letter, each one of the 22 Hebrew letters, to a tone within the three octaves and then he fed it into the computer and oh my gosh the music that came out I, I wish I would have thought of this earlier we'd play it for you right now the 23rd Psalm when you hear the 23rd Psalm played out of the Bible just from the notes going in, in the order that they're in the Bible. It's beautiful. And when you think about that, if God wrote the Bible, God wrote the song. And so David's down there playing the harp, and the demons are hearing in the other dimension. In the other dimension, they're hearing the Word of God. Saul may be hearing notes, but they're hearing the Word of God, and boy, they cannot stand the Word of God. The Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. See, praise and worship. If you, I honestly believe, if you receive a song from God, that not only is it saying what we say, but that those notes are saying something in the realm of the Spirit. Pam, where are you, Pam? Pam, are you here still? Stand up, please. Wave at everybody. Do that queen thing, you know. All right. Several of the songs that we sang in, on our worship team, she has written. And I truly believe that she's anointed of God as a psalmist. And I believe that the words that she gets are from the Lord, but I believe that there's going to be a point in time when we move over into the realm of the Spirit where we're going to find out what those notes said. Because God didn't give you those melodies just by, well, I think I'll throw a, few notes together you know he didn't do it like some garage band praise will break down barriers all right in closing here let me give you this Joshua 6 16 and the seventh time it happened when the priests blew the trumpets that Joshua said to the people shout for the Lord has given you the city what happened they blow their trumpets. Wow. <laughs> oh. Verse 20, Joshua 6, 20. So the people shouted, and when the priests blew the trumpets, and it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout, that the wall fell down. Then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. You've got some cities you need to take. And I'll tell you what, they can be taken with just a little bit of praise and worship and magnifying God. It's not all just book learning. There's some just, I'm just going to praise him. And you just say, I love you, Father. You say, well, how do you start? You start just that way. Well, how do I just praise him? I can't sing. I can't carry a tune in a bucket. No, that's true. I've been sitting next to some of you sometimes. And I know some of you can't. But, but that's why you're not on the worship team. Okay. But, <laughs> but it's music to God. It's music to God. And you may be back there just going, Holy, 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 oh, Lord 
God Almighty, I love you, Lord, I love you, Lord. You know, that's music to his ears. It's coming from your heart. You don't have to be an opera star, you know. When should we praise him? I'm going to give you some quick notes here. Philippians 4.4, 4. rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. How often? Okay, that's good. Psalm 62.8, trust in him at all times. How often? You people, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Psalm 113.3, from the rising of the sun till it's going down, the Lord's name is to be praised. That means like when you're awake, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything, not for everything, you don't say, oh, Lord, thank you that my neighbor ran over my dog. No, you don't, you don't thank him because something bad happened. But even though your neighbor ran over your dog, you say, Lord, you're Lord. You're. It's a tough time for me because I loved old pooch. And I loved the dog too. <laughs> Whatever, okay. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God of Christ Jesus for you. God's will is for you to in, give thanks in all things, through all things, not for all things. You don't thank God for what the devil does, because that is blasphemy. And that's, boy, that's another sermon, another day. You do not want to say, well, the Lord took him. Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord destroyed my family, but it was for a purpose. The Lord broke my leg. I, he's trying to teach me something. No, no. You know what Jesus said? When Jesus healed somebody and the Pharisees said, the devil did it, he did it by Beelzebub. Remember that? Jesus said, when you say, that the work of God is the devil. That's blasphemy and it's unforgivable. You can say whatever you want to say about me, but, but you, don't put the, you don't attribute the works of the devil to God. You, you keep the devil's works lined out. You, you need to know who he is. You need to know who God is. And even though the devil may do stuff in all of his doing, you praise God. You worship him. When the Hebrew boys were in the furnace, they were in the furnace. They didn't praise God, thank you, Lord, for throwing us in the furnace. No, they didn't do that. But w while they were in the furnace, they didn't quit praising the Lord. They praised him in all things. Are you following me? Do you see the difference? They praised him not for all things, but they praised him in all things. And that's where it doesn't matter if everybody's getting ready to stone you and you're over in the corner of the cave and there's 300 of them and there's one of you. It doesn't matter. You praise the Lord. You encourage yourself in the Lord. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will raise you up. All right? How do you praise him? With your mouth. Hebrews 13, 15. Therefore, by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Wow. You worship him with your hands. 1 Timothy 2.8. I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. You know, that's something that used to always bother me when I was a Southern Baptist pastor. I had grown up, let's, let's all pray. How do we pray? We bow our heads, we close our eyes, and we don't raise our hands. I remember the first time I ever raised my hands, I thought I was a wild man. I did this. You remember that, don't you? We were at a Bible study and everybody was raising their hands. They were all Pentecostals or something. And I was a Baptist. And, you know, they're all raising their hands. So I think, I'm going to join in. <laughs> I remember doing it. And I'm going, I'm getting wild. I'm wild. Man, look at me. I'm wild. <laughs> I never will forget that. That was so. And I look back on it, and I think they probably looked at me and thought, what's wrong with him? <laughs> hmm. Psalm 34, 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 
Rejoice always. That's a good verse. Psalm 45, 17. I will make your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, the people shall praise you forever and ever. And our last verse of the day, as the worship team comes up, Psalm 107, verse 21. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them sacrifice the sacrifice of thanksgiving. You want to do a sacrifice? Oh, if I could just sacrifice for Jesus. He's done, you know, sometimes we get so religious that it gags people. Jesus has done so much for me. If I could just do something for him. You want to die on a cross? No, something else. You want to get scourged? No, think of something else. Come on now. <laughs> I think we need to have a, a Bible conference in the Bahamas. No, I tell you what. You know what he wants? It's so simple. He's paid the price. He wants a sacrifice of praise. And that's the fruit of the lips. That's what he wants. Can we give it to him? Psalm 107, 21. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them sacrifice the sacrifice of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. We have ministers today in the lighthouse. If you're not a born-again believer, you need to get saved. You need Jesus. How do you do that? He paid the price. All you got to do is just say, I receive. And believe it in your heart. You know, the Bible says if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and you believe that God raised him from the dead, you really believe that, and you confess it, you're saved. And we have people who will guide you in your confession. If you're a born-again believer and you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, you can be filled with the Holy Spirit and have the same evidence that we talked about earlier. You can speak with new tongues. And you can give praise to God. You know, you may just be hurting, and even though we've been talking about how we're set free, you can have a broken heart concerning something, and you just need somebody to agree with you that you'll start praising God, really. You just need somebody to agree with you that God is good. We can agree with that. That's good. We have ministers there for you. And uh, as we sing this song, if you would like to have ministry, you can just slip on out to the lighthouse. We're going to sing this song, and when this song is over, you're dismissed. But we're going to sing Holy Cannoli. You know, Ron, you may not know why I'm saying that. Ron Cannoli wrote this song, okay? But I believe that this song was written by the Holy Spirit. I believe that this song is, is a song that gives praise to God and sometimes we just need to loosen up. Now, now I understand. Keep in mind, I'm a for, former Southern Baptist. I realize it. I was in a service one time tapping my toe, and I was thinking, I'm dancing. You know, so, you know, we, we've all got this stuff we've got to come out of. It's okay. God loves you where you are. Some of you are wild and crazy. Some of you are just crazy. Some are just wild. You know, but you just be you. You be you. You go before the Lord. Don't try to be your imitation of somebody up here or imitation of somebody you've seen on TV. No, you be you. You just worship God the way you worship God. That's what God wants. He doesn't want your imitation of somebody else. He wants you. If you're calm, be calm. It's okay. If you're wild, want to run around the church, run around the church. It's okay. But you be you because that's how God created you. He loves you the way you are as long as you're praising and worshiping him, all right?